Hello, darlings. It's time once again for the Pulp Raconteur and The Swordsman of Mars by Otis Adelbert Klein. Now, you may be wondering where the hell I am. Well, darlings, you should. This is a gorge inside of the Atlas Mountains. The white noise you hear behind me is actually a river that is running through it that carved this gorge. Uh, we are in um, Balmond Dedes and or Belmondes, and we are uh, high in Morocco's elevations on our way to the Sahara Desert, where the next installment of this book will be. So let's get to it, shall we? When the last we saw our hero, he was now supposed to be the guardian of the emperor's favorite daughter, his only daughter. And apparently this is akin to being sent to the headsman. Chapter 10. When Thorn, escorted by the palace officer, reached the apartments of Neva, the sun had set, and the luxuriously furnished rooms were lighted by the soft amber radiance of the half-hooded viridium globes which hung from the ceiling on golden chains. The size and magnificence of the suite reserved for the daughter of this apostle of simplicity, who would make all citizens equal, was astounding. The chamber in which he found himself opened onto a broad terrace which led to a private garden, separated from the rest of the palace grounds by a high wall. Cove Lutus, standing in the circular doorway, smiled at their approach. Greetings, Sheb Takor, he said after exchanging salutes with the two officers. She whom we guard is resting on the terrace. The orders are to stay always within sight and call when she sleeps to stand guard just outside her chamber door. Thorn took up Kovlutus's position in the doorway. I'll try to carry out the orders. A good dinner and sound rest to you. And to you a pleasant vigil, replied Kovlutus. Not until both officers had gone out did Thorn steal a glance at the girl he was to guard. He was unable to suppress a gasp. Her eyes, languorous beneath the fringed curtains of those sleepy lids, were liquid pools of lapis lazuli. Her small nose was a most exquisitely chiseled bit of sculpture. Her red lips, slightly parted, revealed teeth that were matched pearls, and her hair was spun gold and sunbeams. For some time she was motionless, gazing pensively out over the garden, Presently, she crossed the terrace and descended to the garden. Watching her, Thorn stood bemused, wondering if it were possible that the scrawny, rat-faced Dickstar could be the father of so beautiful a daughter. So potent was the spell cast over his senses that he lost sight of her in the shrubbery before he remembered his orders and ran down the steps into the garden. For some time, Thorn hurried blindly about in the garden. Then the nearer moon, suddenly blinking above the rooftops to the west, came to his assistance. By its pale light he saw Neva not fifty feet from him, seated on the rim of a limpid pool in the center of which a fountain babbled. Slowly he moved closer and halted at a distance of about twenty feet. As he stood there, he was recalled to mundane considerations by a burning sensation in the region of his knees. Lowering his hand to investigate the cause, he discovered that heat rays were emanating from an ornate globe, about two feet high, which stood behind the path. I apologize for the noise, noise dear ones, but it is seemingly more busy on the road through the scourge. In order to escape the discomfort caused by the proximity of the heating globe, he moved a few steps nearer to the fountain. A dried twig snapped beneath his foot, and the girl looked up, a startled expression on her face. Have no fear, said Thorn. I am Sheb Takor, your new guard. I know, she replied. It was the noise that startled me. You see, I am expecting someone I am not at all anxious to meet. Though he felt quite sure he knew who that someone was, Thorn did not venture to say so. Heavy footsteps sounded on the garden path. A shadow fell athwart the pool. Thorn glanced across to where the shadow began. Behind Neva stood Selhan. The Dickstar's deputy salutes his fair daughter, he said. 
Without replying or even turning her head, Neva called to Thorn. A trespasser has intruded upon my privacy, guardsman. Remove him. The earthman stood forward and stood facing his enemy. It seems you are not wanted, he said quietly. I trust that under the circumstances, you will not have the bad taste to remain. Selhan left contemptuously. Out of my way, worm, he ordered. You dare not raise a hand against me. He sat down familiarly beside Neva. Your guardsman is a spineless coward. Once he faced me, sword in hand, but grew so frightened before a blow had been struck that he dropped his weapon and fainted. Thorn ground his teeth in impotent rage. He knew that under the Martian code he must suffer in silence any abuse which this fellow might choose to heap on him, physical violence or an assault with a weapon excepted. I would have you know, Shed Tagor, Neva said, ignoring the presence of Selhan, that all the details of that unfortunate affair of yours at the training school are known to me. It was cowardly of your opponent to slash you when you were weakened from loss of blood and numbed by the virus of a desert blood fly. And in full accord with that craven blow is his present refusal to again meet you while he relies on the passivity which his technical victory imposes on you. At this, the deputy forced a derisive laugh. Would it please the Dickstar's daughter to have her guard slain before her eyes? It would please her guard, retorted Thorn, to have the opportunity of defending himself. No doubt it would, grinned Selhan. He moved closer to Neva. Come, he said. Send away this cowardly guard who is powerless to help you. There is something I want to ask you. Familiarly, he passed his arm around her shoulders, and when, with blazing eyes, she would have leapt away from him, he held her tightly. Thorn instantly whipped out his sword. Release her or die, he commanded, presenting his point at the deputy's breast. The deputy let her go and stood erect, glaring. Have you abandoned your honor? I might ask you the same, retorted Thorn, sheathing a sword, but I know a man is incapable of abandoning that which he has never had. It seems, said Selhan, a deadly glitter in his eyes, that you have forgotten the code and something else. I am glad you have not forgotten that you are my guardsman, Sheb Takor Jen, interposed Neva. And since you are acting in that capacity and not in your own personal interest, it would seem that you are at liberty to treat this trespasser as you would any other. I had hoped that the Dickstar's daughter would confirm me in that belief, replied Thorn. The Earthman's fist shot up in a short arc that ended beneath Selhan's protruding chin. There was a tremendous splash as the deputy measured his length in the chilly pool. Thorn leapt back and waited tensely, hand on hilt. His enemy came up sputtering and cursing luridly in English, then stepped over the rim. He bowed low before the girl. Permit me to congratulate the Dickstar's daughter on the singular efficiency of her guardsmen. It is only exceeded by his total lack of honor. Then he turned and strode away with the water sloshing in his boots and dripping from his clothing. Thorn's hand fell limply from his sword hilt. He was bitterly disappointed, for he had felt certain that Selhan would come out of that enforced bath, raging and eager to try conclusions with him. A coward, a miserable, slinking coward! Neva was speaking, half to herself, as she gazed after the departing figure. She turned and looked up at Thorn. He is afraid to measure swords with you, she said, but he will find some other way to be rid of you. He is cunning. Oh, so cunning and treacherous. She laid a slim hand on the Earthman's arm. The deputy has considerable influence with the Dickstar, my father. But for that matter, so have I. And I will help you. In spite of the preconceived dislike of this little beauty, Thorn thrilled at her glance and touch. I am honored that the Dickstar's daughter should be interested in preserving my worthless life, he replied. He is a strange and terrible creature, this Selhan, she went on. 
Did you notice the queer gibberish he used when he came out of the water? Some incantation, perhaps, to a strange god. No doubt, he is a sorcerer. Recalling the deputy's lurid English curses, Thorne smiled to himself and replied, I doubt not that he was calling down the wrath of some deity on my head. Neva yawned prettily. I am sleepy, she said. We will go in now, for I must retire. You may walk beside me. Slowly, side by side, stepping in perfect unison, they went up the path which led to the house. At the steps which led up to the terrace, she took his arm. Again he felt the thrill of her touch, and fought it with every ounce of willpower at his command. As they entered the doorway, a slave girl hurried to take up her mistress's cloak. Another moved the lever which uncapped the beridium light globes, making the room brilliant as day, and still another hurried in, bearing a tray on which was a tiny jeweled cup of steaming pulchro, which she offered to Neva. Bring another cup for the gem, she said. The girl hurried out and returned a moment later with a larger cup. I drink to my brave and efficient guardsmen, smiled Neva, and I to the lovely and precious jewel which he guards, replied Thorn. What will happen next? Where will you get the story from? This is once again The Swordsman of Mars by Otis Adelbert Klein.